good, good afternoon. Thank you, Anne. Uh, so for the next um, quarter of an hour or so, I'll, I'll give you um, Ricardo's perspective on uh, fuel cells as a motive power source for, in the automotive industry. And I've entitled this, Fuel Cells Has Their Time Arrived? Uh, I'll start off with just two or three very quick minutes on Ricardo, for those of you who are not aware of us. We are one of the world's leading independent automotive consultancies, both offer giving clients commercial and technical advice. We have 90 years of history delivering value across multiple sectors. So this is the traditional passenger car, commercial vehicle, off-highway, but also we do a lot of work with government, financial services, and the clean energy and power generation sectors. And we support clients' development of product, technology, investment, and growth strategies. And we work pretty much across the whole of the value chain. And this includes policy advice, helping powertrain strategy and powertrain development, supply chain, investment strategy, mergers, acquisitions, and divestments, brand and product strategy, and market entry, <coughs> market entry and growth strategy. So, hydrogen. Hydrogen is clearly a practical, long-range energy vector, but it's not without its challenges. Biofuels may be the simplest option to implement, but biofuels suffer from multiple demands for feedstock, both from other processes, but also from human beings and animals to actually literally eat the feed food stock. Use of biomass for heat and power. So ultimately, the potential in road transport may be limited. And recently, the EU has said they want to limit, they want to cap biofuels to 5% by volume, as opposed to a policy ambition previously of about 10%. In the medium term, out to 2025, electricity will also remain limited as a long-range fuel. So if we look at battery mass and battery cost, a 500-kilometer range, which is a perfectly reasonable range for a liquid fossil fuel and even for a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, you're talking about a 700 kilogram, 25 to 35,000 euro battery at today's current costs and energy densities. New battery technologies, this, this Moore's law concept of doubling the power and halving the cost that, we, that we're seeking, these may not be ready in the time frames we're thinking about. Lithium air is under development, but has a huge amount to prove. We know all about range anxiety, people's concern that the vehicle may literally run out of power and leave them stranded. To charge a battery in 10 minutes, which is you know, probably twice as long as it takes to refuel a petrol or hydrogen vehicle, we're talking about 300 kilowatts of power, huge amounts of power, huge issues around cost, cooling and infrastructure. And it's really in niche segments. Electric vehicles do not cover full 10, 11 segments that we recognize in the automotive industry. So hydrogen has a series of advantages. Production is relatively simple from primary energy sources, but energy efficiency is low and the green credentials are questionable. You can store it in a tank and get 500 kilometers of range, but it's very expensive. It's refillable on a time scale that we're used to with petrol diesel cars, but the systems are scarce and complex. And we have had them demonstrated today in products with all of the attributes that we'd recognize in our conventional vehicles. But commercialization is a long way off. And I'm going to spend the next 10, 12 minutes looking at those four key themes. Using hydrogen as a fuel is arguably an inefficient use of energy. So producing hydrogen from electricity, you look at overall energy losses of around 80%. That compares with energy losses of around 40% from a diesel hybrid and about 25 to 30% energy losses using electricity directly to charge an electric vehicle. So already we're looking at significant energy inefficiencies. Clearly, if we generate, if we create, uh, produce the hydrogen from purely renewable sources of electricity, then the carbon dioxide is virtually zero or is zero. But most industrial production of hydrogen using the average European grid mix produces between 100 and 150 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilometer driven. So it would seem that renewable energy sources are probably best used to supply electricity directly to electric vehicles unless there's a genuine surplus of renewables. 
So if fuel cell vehicles are to be beneficial from both energy security and carbon footprint perspectives, we need to reduce the carbon's CO2, the CO2 intensity from production. If you look at this chart, on the extreme left, if we use renewables, then there is no CO2 produced. But the average European hydrogen production is about 110, 115 grams per kilometre. That is very similar to what a current hybrid diesel powertrain will create. And if you were looking at a PHEV, a plug-in hybrid diesel, that is significantly lower, maybe 82, 83 grams, significantly lower than the 110 grams from a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. So already you're seeing perhaps that hybrid diesels and advanced diesel powertrains may be a more CO2 efficient way of moving forward. Fuel cell vehicles will remain very expensive in the foreseeable future, and we've forecasted out to 2025 here. But we know that the cost of key components will fall rapidly if production quantities ramp up. We've seen, I think, the Model T and even mobile phones. Production costs tend to half for every 10 to 15% increase in volume. That's the impact of economies of scale in mass production. So looking at the left-hand scale, you see that this is a C segment. So this is Volkswagen Golf Ford Focus sized vehicle. Our current views are that a, a mass produced fuel cell vehicle would be about 35,000 pounds by 2015. And we're saying there, we expect there to be a global production of about 15 to 20,000 fuel cell vehicles by this time frame. By 2025, we think that would have dropped to under 25,000 pounds, about 23,000 pounds. At the same time, because of increasing cost of emissions legislation, we see conventional vehicles, be that pure internal combustion engine or diesel, actually increasing in cost. These are real-term costs. So by 2025, you could be saying a fuel cell vehicle, 23,000 pounds, and a diesel hybrid, 21, 22,000 pounds. So that gap will close very rapidly. On the right-hand side, you see how we see the actual cost of the powertrain decreasing over that time. From 15,000 units production to about 100,000 to over half a million units produced by 2025, we see the fuel cell itself for a C-segment vehicle dropping from about 8,500 pounds to around 3,000 pounds, and the storage dropping from about 4,000 pounds to 2,000 pounds. But again, this is all predicated on significant volumes. And it's worth picking up on the comment that Anne made about the Hyundai announcement today of mass production of their first fuel cell vehicle. Um, at the conference in August, I spoke to their chief engineer and asked him to define mass production. And he said they're looking to produce 2,000 units a year. And I said, well, that's not really mass production. And his comment was, well, no, it's going down the production line. It's going down a mass production line. So that's how we can get away with it. But 2,000 units a year, that suggests by 2015, eight or 10 players each producing two or 3,000 units, we could be talking about 15 to 20,000 units in the next two to three years. But volume is key to reducing cost. <coughs> Hydrogen is abundant, but <coughs> infrastructure remains a key hurdle, and there are currently very few refueling stations. Current European production of hydrogen would power about a third of the current stock of vehicles on the European roads. So there is plentiful hydrogen for a future potential fuel cell market. We've already discussed the fact that the carbon benefits may be questionable. Currently, there are about 500 fueling stations, most of them in Central Europe and the United States of America. But this compares to 100,000 petrol stations in the US alone. So obviously, a significant investment is required in infrastructure. However, as Hyundai proved, even with today's relatively low volume of fueling stations, you can drive a fuel cell vehicle from Gothenburg to Monte Carlo. So you can drive on your summer holiday, even now, across Europe, with this very few um, refueling stations available. And the final point I want to cover off is when do we actually think commercialization may happy, happen? Well, we've said Hyundai are looking to mass produce 2,000 units by end of 2012, beginning of 2013. We see that enthusiasm, and a lot of that has been driven, I have to say, by, by politicians. Enthusiasm has sprinted ahead of the technology. 
fuel cell use in vehicles is likely to be one of the last applications for fuel cells. I think this morning there's a lot of discussion around fuel cells for stationary applications. We did some research looking at the industry, the automotive industry's view of commercialization. And in 1990, we interviewed a bunch of R&D directors of automotive firms, and the view then was that fuel cell vehicles would be a mass market in 12 years. That's a 1990 consensus. We did the same research in 2000, and the lead time had dropped to about eight to 10 years. So 16 years of R&D investment brought us four years closer to a mass market. So if you extrapolate that, and management consultants love to extrapolate single data points to make a universal truth. But if you extrapolate that, that suggests we have a mass market around 2025 to 2030. And I think that ties in with previous slides looking at our assumptions about market size and market cost. So the market is growing now, but we're looking at 10 plus years until it becomes a mass segment. And we do believe in the long term there will be a mass market shift to new energy vectors, including hydrogen, <coughs> driven by fuel, fuel economy regulations, energy security, and emissions rules. So our, our, our standard Ricardo roadmap sees us moving through mild and micro, mild and micro hybrid to plug-in hybrids, to mass market EV technology, assuming an energy storage breakthrough, assuming this Moore's law, double the power, half the cost happens. And by 2020, we see the development of this mass market for fuel cell vehicles. In the same time, we see regulation changing, going from tailpipe CO2 to a concept of well-to-wheels CO2, and possibly then moving into full life cycle CO2, including the manufacturing, the use, and the disposal of the vehicle. So we definitely see this happening. We see the demonstrator programs happening now. We see products starting to appear, and we see the mass market 10 or so years away. So what can we do to accelerate and advance this mass market? It will clearly, and the last four or five slides I've shown you illustrate this, it will clearly require technical and economic advances and cohesive strategy between industry and government. We need to accelerate the decarbonisation of hydrogen to give fuel cell vehicles real CO2 and emissions benefits. C civic initiatives be they infrastructure or fleet investments, have a key role to play. From an OEM's point of view and a supplier point of view, policy cohesion and policy stability is vital. <coughs> OEMs and suppliers will have a number of years of lost leadership, of loss making and highly expensive R&D to bring this fuel cell vehicle market to fruition. And they need to know that emissions rules and other rules remain stable in this period. OEMs and suppliers will invest in R&D and market development on materials cost and robust manufacturing processes and developing supply chains and supporting economies of scale to bring that total cost of ownership down to pa towards parity with conventional powertrain. Interestingly, all of those points hold absolutely true for pure electric vehicles as well. Ricardo was part of the Roads to Highcom project and out of that project came seven key steps that are required to support the market. Vigor these include vigorous research to address key issues, development of skill base and supply base, stimulate the early market through incentives, R&D and infrastructure financing, both from the public and private sector, long-term policy stability to support those investments, joined up energy policy to support the decarbonisation of hydrogen production, and cohesion of policy across the European Union. So, thank you very much indeed, and look forward to questions later on.